In this video, we're going to look at three examples of hybridization in real molecules, sp, sp2, and sp3 hybridization, and talk about how to assign the hybridization state of an atom based on its number of electron pair domains, or electron domains, a quantity that we've actually encountered previously in the context of Vesper theory. So we're going to sort of back up our process of structural analysis to this key point of determining the steric number and see how we can sort of insert hybridization there as a conclusion we can draw from the steric number of an atom. But let's start with this survey of different hybridization states. So let's begin with the central carbon atom in CO2. Now, to really dig into hybridization and, for example, assign hybridization state, we need a Lewis structure because we need to know how many electron domains are associated with the central atom, how many sigma bonds and non-bonding lone pairs, for example, exist at the central atom. And I'm actually going to use the coloring scheme we used previously to denote sigma and pi bonding electrons. At the central atom in CO2, we've got two sigma bonds. Remember, the first bond is always a sigma bond, and two pi bonds. And so to understand the hybridization here, we've got to recognize that those two bonds highlighted in purple are sigma bonds derived from the overlap of hybrid orbitals associated with the central carbon atom and the outer oxygen atoms, potentially, although we don't necessarily need to worry about which orbitals are involved from the outer oxygen atoms. All we need to know is that we need enough hybrids to make two sigma bonds. And in order to achieve that, we need to put in two atomic orbitals to get two hybrid atomic orbitals out. And so that's going to involve one 2s orbital and one 2p orbital. So we mix these together. The result is hybridization to form a set of two hybrid orbitals, one for each of the sigma bonds. And these are sp hybrids. So here's one sp hybrid, here's the other sp hybrid. And if we put those two together, we see that the axes of their lobes point in the linear geometry, which we sort of already knew was the geometry of, of CO2. And this is exactly the geometry we need to form those two sigma bonds to the oxygens, linear geometry. So two regions of electron density, two sigma bonds need to be made, two atomic orbitals in the hybrids, sp hybridization. And note also the energies of the sp hybrids. The energies are halfway between the energies of the s orbital and the p orbital on that carbon atom. And that mathematical equation represents that. We can also represent that on an energy diagram by sort of arbitrarily laying down, okay, here are the two p orbitals, here is the two s orbital. Let's go ahead and label those. And the hybrids are exactly halfway between those two right there. We also have one, uh, sorry, two remaining unhybridized 2p orbitals that did not engage in sigma bonding. Those are involved in pi bonding. We'll see that a little bit later. So that's sp hybridization. Now let's consider the central boron atom in BH3, again beginning by drawing a Lewis structure for the BH3 molecule. In this molecule, we've got a boron with three electron domains at the central atom and three sigma bonds. And let's go ahead and highlight those in purple here. In order to make three sigma bonds, we need three hybrid orbitals associated with that central boron atom. And that's going to involve an s orbital and uh, a 2s orbital and two 2p orbitals here labeled px and py going into the magical orbital mixing machine. And the result are three hybrid orbitals out. Each of these is sp2. So here's one of the sp2s, here's another, and here's the third. And these are aligned along the directions of the trigonal planar geometry. This tries to show it in three dimensions. It's sort of marginally successful. But for example, this one's coming out towards you slightly. This one's going back away from you slightly and this one's also going back away from you slightly. Take my word for it, they're arranged in the trigonal planar geometry, and you can see the 120 degree bond angle designated there as well. So the hybrids have the right orientation to account for the trigonal planar geometry. Here the energy is two thirds of the way from S to P, and again, this equation represents that. So if we lay down again, the energies of the s and p orbitals on an energy level diagram. Let me do that in purple. So p orbitals here at the top and the s orbital at the bottom of the boron atom. 
the SP2 hybrids are about two-thirds of the way. I mean, they're exactly two-thirds of the way, but I'm trying to draw them as close to two-thirds as I can. The SP2 hybrids are uh, about two-thirds of the way up from uh, the S to the P orbitals, so something, something like this. So somewhat higher in energy than the SP hybrids, other things being equal. Finally, let's consider what happens when we need to make four sigma bonds or have four regions of electron density. In the molecule CH4, we've got the tetrahedral geometry. So let's start as we did with the other two, draw a Lewis structure. That Lewis structure looks like this. How many sigma bonds are at that central carbon atom? Well, we have one, two, three, and four. So we need four hybrid orbitals to make four sigma bonds to that central carbon atom. And we do this by throwing in the 1s orbital, I should say the 1-2s orbital, and the 3-2p orbitals, 2px, 2py, and 2pz, and the result is four hybrid orbitals. Now, these are drawn in a rather confusing manner in, in the figure, but uh, bear with me here. There's one here that's pointed out towards you, one here, there's one here that's pointed out towards you, and there's one that's sort of in the plane like this. Take my word for it that that is an attempt to represent the tetrahedral geometry. And um, yeah, so we've generated four hybrids. These are the sp3 hybrids, sp3, 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 and there are four of them, and they're aligned along the directions of the corners of a, a tetrahedron. The energy here now, well, if we do the math, We've got 75% p characters, so the energies of the sp3 hybrids are 75% of the way from s to p. So one more time, let's lay down on an energy level diagram the 2p orbitals, 2p, 2s, and the sp3 hybrids are now three quarters of the way from s to p. So three fourths here, one fourth here, if you like. And these are, again, other things being equal, the sp3 hybrids are higher in energy than the sp2 and sp hybrids. So this is a general survey of the three hybridization states that we'll deal with, sp, sp2, and sp3. And we can see how it depends on the number of sigma bonds, or more generally, when non-bonding lone pairs come in, the number of non-bonding, uh, the number of electron domains, or electron pair domains, associated with the atom whose hybridization state we're trying to determine. So again, we've got sp, CO2, sp2 in BH3, and sp3 in BH4. Now this kind of, in uh, CH4. Now this begs the question, how do we do this in a general way? What is the general process for determining the hybridization state? And this actually goes back to how we determine the Vesper geometry, the electron pair or electron group geometry associated with a central atom in a molecule. Step one, as you might have guessed, is generate a Lewis structure. We need to be able to determine the number of electron domains at the central atom, and to do that, we need to know how the atoms are connected, where are the bonding and non-bonding electrons, that kind of thing. So we've got to have a Lewis structure. Step two, which we did in the Vesper theory discussions as well, is to determine what's called the steric number of that atom of interest. And this is the number of electron domains. And remember, in thinking about electron domains, we're treating a single bond, a double bond, and a triple bond as equivalent in terms of counting, and each of these corresponds to one electron domain, one contiguous region of space where electrons are located. And now that we've talked about sigma and pi bonding, we can recognize that each of these is associated with either one sigma bond, single, double, triple bond, or you can think about a lone pair as occupying its, its own electron domain as well. So each of these corresponds to one electron domain because there's either one non-bonding lone pair there or one sigma bond there. And from there, systematically, I mean, we can do the analysis that we did on the previous slides, but now that we've seen how that generalizes, we can just assign the set of hybrid orbitals that corresponds to the steric number, the number of hybrids essentially we need to make the sigma bonds and hold the non-bonding lone pairs at our atom of interest. So the steric number of two, for example, is always associated with sp hybridization. 
Steric number of three is always associated with sp2 hybridization. Steric number of four is always associated with sp3 hybridization. So now notice that we can insert this into our problem solving process for Vesper geometries, for the electron group geometry. Once I've got that electron group geometry, and I know it's trigonal planar, for example, I know that the hybridization of that atom must be sp2. Let's work a practice problem where we put this into action. So we're interested in the sulfate anion, SO42- in the hybridization state of the sulfur ion, uh, the sulfur atom in this ion. So going back, step one, got to generate a Lewis structure for this molecule. Sulfur is going to be at the center. It's the least electronegative atom, and we're going to have oxygens around the outside. Now, the sulfur will have no lone pairs, and we'll um, figure that out. We can figure that out a number of different ways. You can take my word for it, or you can work it yourself, that this sulfur is going to end up with two double bonds in the best Lewis structure to two of the oxygens, and we'll have lone pairs around the other oxygens and negative charge on the two singly bonded oxygens. We can go back and review Lewis structures to brush up on this, but take my word for it, this is the Lewis structure of the sulfate anion, and these lone pairs are actually not directly relevant. Once you realize that the sulfur, central sulfur atom has no lone pairs and a bonding pattern like this, we're pretty much good to go. The next thing we want to do is determine the steric number, and this is the number of electron domains at the central atom, counting double and triple bonds as one, and counting lone pairs as one, and, and single bonds as one. And we've got four of those. We've got one here, one here, and one for each of the double bonds. And what I'm going to do is highlight just one of those bonds in purple, so that we recall that each of those SO double bonds has one SO sigma bond associated with it. So another way to think about that sulfur is it needs to form four sigma bonds. This is why it needs four hybrid orbitals. Four sigma bonds means that I need four hybrid orbitals here at that sulfur. Now, how do I get four hybrids? Well, I need a hybridization state. Let's just, in general, call it SPN. I need a hybridization state such that N plus 1, the NP orbitals plus the 1S orbital, adds up to 4. And from that, I can immediately conclude that this N needs to be 3, and that the hybridization state of that sulfur atom is SP3. So we can think of each of the SO bonds, for example, as involving the overlap of an sp3 hybrid orbital on sulfur with either a hybrid orbital or a simple atomic p orbital on oxygen at the same time. Let's do one more example involving urea. This is a somewhat more complicated Lewis structure, and we're interested in the hybridization state of the central carbon atom in this guy. All right, NH2, CO, NH2. Well, carbon is, I believe, the least electronegative atom in this, uh, heavy atom in this molecule. So carbon is going to be at the center, and the oxygen and nitrogens will be on the outside. The two H's in the NH2 group will be linked to nitrogen, and actually they're not going to be directly relevant to the hybridization of the carbon, so I'm just going to write them in as NH2. We should notice, though, that in order for that oxygen to be by itself, we're going to need a double bond to carbon. And we'll go ahead and add the lone pairs on the outer uh, atoms. There are no lone pairs at the central carbon atom because it's already satisfying the octet rule, formally neutral, all that good stuff. Now we're counting electron domains, determining the steric number. And I have one domain here for the double bond. I've got a domain here. I've got a domain here. So we could either say I've got a steric number of three because I have three regions of electron density, if you like, or I could say I need to form three sigma bonds at that central carbon atom because it's got three sigma bonds, as we've inferred from the Lewis structure. So three sigma bonds means I need three hybrid orbitals at that central carbon atom, and this means that my total number of atomic orbitals in the hybrid orbital mixture must be three. That's going to correspond to one s and two Ps, sp2 hybridization at that central carbon atom. In the next section, we're going to take a look at multiple bonds, returning to unhybridized p orbitals, 
and observe, for example, this is actually a great example of this, that when we have sp2 or sp hybridization, there are p orbitals left over that can also participate in bonding, but not sigma bonding, pi bonding. So we think, for example, about this second bond of the CO double bond as a pi bond involving unhybridized p orbitals, very similar to the picture we already developed in earlier discussions of pi bonding. We're just going to layer that on top of hybridization to complete our discussion of valence bond theory.